for coming uh, to this, like, this message training on the so-called hard case in the abortion debate. Uh, this is based upon a five-state study done. It's the only study ever done on these difficult cases. And it was commissioned by Rights Life of Michigan, Georgia Rights Life, and also Personhood. Um, it was based upon the state of Colorado, Iowa, North Dakota, Michigan, and Georgia. And basically after Todd Aiken's unfortunate remarks, as well as Richard Murdoch's remarks being twisted uh, several years ago, um, you know, I definitely saw a need to be able to have messaging for legislators on this issue because if we want them to defend us and, you know, carry the water for us, so to speak, then we ought to be able to equip them. And um, unfortunately, the number one message in the pro-life movement for almost 50 years now has been to, not to defend, but to diminish, to say, well, it's only 1%. And in a sense, that's what Todd Aiken did. And he actually took his comments from a pro-life book that was written by Dr. Jeff Wilkie. He's a hero in the pro-life movement. Definitely appreciated him, but I honestly wish that those remarks had not been included in his book um, to suggest, I mean, you know, you know what the allegations were, uh, so I won't repeat it. But uh, that definitely hurts because whenever you diminish and you say that it's only 1%, that's really the worst thing you could ever say. Uh, even though it's been the number one response from pro-life leaders for decades, because it does sound like it's uncaring. Um, it sounds like you're diminishing the suffering of rape victims and their children. And really what it does is it just makes it easier to uh, justify the exception because they're only 1%. And my friend Jim Sable from our organization, who was also conceived in rape, he asks, what percentage do we have to be before you matter? I mean, Asians are 1% of the population. Muslims are 1% of the population. But you would never hear anybody say, well, we don't need to defend them because they're only 1%. Uh, one of the basic principles of, of our country is that <coughs> You know, we defend the least. That's actually a, a biblical principle too, right? You know, defend the least of these. You defend the underdog, um, and that's why we have these rights secured, the Fourteenth Amendment, that says that no state shall deprive a person of their right to life without due process of law, and no state shall deny a person equal protection of the laws and. When you say, well, they're only 1% and you're ready to deny them that protection, then you're really saying that's not a person. And that's what the U.S. Supreme Court said in footnote 54 of Roe versus Wade under the personhood discussion. The court pointed out the fact that Texas had exceptions and exemptions. And while it wasn't the rape exception, there were other exceptions. Uh, and that it wasn't really much of a penalty for doing, uh, as compared to other forms of homicide, and so the court basically said, Texas, you don't really believe that's a person. And so you undermine your whole argument for the right to life, which comes from that due process clause, and for personhood when you have exceptions, because you're, you're denying equal protection. Uh, and so what happened is, uh, I spoke in Congress two months after Aiken and Murdoch lost and Romney lost and you had um, certain political pundits blaming this issue, uh, like Ann Coulter saying that, you know, it's indefensible, can't you just say, you know, you're pro-life with exception, what's so hard about that? And so I put up on our website for Save the One, that's savetheone.com and that's the number one, not the word one. Uh, tips for legislators on this issue. I've been speaking since 1995. I've spent my entire adult life since learning how I was conceived at 18 defending my right to life, and I, I'm pretty good at messaging. Um, but when I spoke in Congress that January, two months after the election, they all said to me in, in this pro-life caucus where I spoke, 
that it has to be research-based, that the Republican Party doesn't want us talking about this issue unless it's research-based. And of course, I can appreciate that. And so I went to a whole bunch of different pro-life leaders, and it was actually Rights Life in Michigan, Georgia Rights Life and Personhood, who recognized the need for this because they don't compromise on the rape issue. In Michigan, we've never had a rape exception in a single law until just recently, Georgia had no rape exceptions in their law. And so uh, they realized that you know, if we're going to toe the line, we really need to invest in this. And so it was an expensive uh, online interactive study. It wasn't just like a um, focus group where one person could direct everything. But I provided them a lot of the messaging, and people were surveyed at the beginning, halfway through, and at the end. And we could show that we could dramatically sway their opinion on this issue. And of course, the easiest people to sway were people who said that they were pro-life with exceptions. Very easy to sway them by the end. But the people, we were also able to sway people who identified as pro-choice. Um, and I think that that's pretty powerful. One thing we also saw is that the people who were um, let me back up. What we asked people, do you think abortion should be, uh, do you think abortion is wrong? Do you think it's immoral? And depending on the state, it was like 90% said they think it's wrong, it's immoral. But they're going into abortion clinics and they're having abortions, right? I mean, if you ever spent time outside of an abortion clinic, you see women going in there crying. You know, they come out crying. Uh, it's an act of desperation. And it, you know, nobody likes abortion, or at least you know, very few people do, and they're, they're extremely radical, the ones who, who do. Um, like Miley Cyrus, who would lick you know, the, the cake. You know? um, but yeah, most people do not like, overwhelming do not like abortion. They know it's wrong, they think it's immoral, yet they'll go and have one anyway. And then we ask the next question, do you consider yourself to be pro-life? And so you have all these people who say it's wrong and immoral, but they won't identify as pro-life. And so it was depending on the state, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent with these, these states that were um, surveyed, probably like an average of 60 percent with those five states. And so it's interesting that they know it's wrong, but they won't identify as pro-life. And the next question is, do you think it should be illegal? And should it be criminal? And at that point, the numbers dropped to 30 to 40 percent, depending on the state. And so you have all these people who call themselves pro-life, but they, they don't understand what it means to be pro-life. And unfortunately, for the past four to five decades, the messaging in the pro-life movement has been, choose life. You know, you hear a lot of that for years, choose life. Like, as if that's all it means to be pro-life, is as long as you choose life. You know, that as long as you don't like abortion. I mean, we have people who say that they're pro-choice don't think it should be illegal, but they're willing to support the work of pregnancy centers because they don't like abortion, they think it's good work, but you know they're not willing to make it illegal. But what we found is that the people who said that it should be illegal were the people who were 100% pro-life. And so if you want to move in the direction of having a, a truly pro-life country, you need to win them over on the hard cases. Because once you win them over on the so-called hard cases, they understand that this is a human rights issue. And it's not just about, you know, personal responsibility to get yourself pregnant. You know, they understand this is about protecting innocent human life. So people were, um, like I said, they were surveyed and then they were asked to rate all of the messaging. What was the most compelling? What was the most moving? most effective and so we could show that number one uh, the most effective messaging is to put a face to the issue the story of a woman who was conceived in rape you know for some reason that was a little bit more compelling than a man but the you know man conceived in rape is also compelling uh, but also the stories of a woman who became pregnant by rape that was the most compelling as opposed to just sharing statistics and 
And there's a lot of great stats out there that rape victims are worse off after abortion and what have you. Um, but it was those personal stories that were really the most effective. And that's what I've found in my experience, that it's stories which pierce the heart in ways in which arguments cannot. And my philosophical abortion essay that I wrote when I was in law school, it's a 43 page essay, uh, very sound document. Uh, it was ranked number one on Google for decades. I think it's like number four right now. I can challenge anybody to it, but I know that that's not what's effective. What we learn in, in law school, the first day of law school for legal research and writing class is something called IRAC, Issue, Rule, Application, Conclusion. You have to state the issue, state the rule or what the law is, or you could state what the principle is. Then you have to apply it to the real people in your case at hand, and then you conclude. Now you could be the greatest legal scholar and totally know the law, but if you don't know how to apply it to real people, in court you will lose every time. You have to know how to apply your principle to real people. And so it's great to be equipped with all the arguments. We've got the science on our side. We've got the um, philosophical arguments, medical facts, you know, the health, of, of women and, and their unborn children and you know people are going to go with biblical arguments too we've got all of that's on our side but you need to apply the tree of people and of course you know from a biblical perspective that's what christ did you know when he spoke in terms of, of parables and i mean the whole bible is full of stories and we have these principles god's law applied to these stories and you learn lessons and then you remember the principles because you remember the stories and that's, that's what's effective. So it's very important that we do that in the public movement, but especially with this issue, that you humanize that child. Uh, and then the single most powerful pure argument is that you do not punish innocent people for someone else's crime. And there's a lot of different ways of restating that principle. So um, a simple one, a hashtag that we use all the time with my organization is, Punish rapists, not babies. So if you're at a debate with some legislator and he's challenging you, you know, you can stand there and say, look, I believe in punishing rapists, not babies. You know, maybe my opponent believes, you know, punishing babies instead of the perpetrators, but I for one don't stand for that. People respect that answer. Even if you haven't won them over, they respect that answer. That's not gonna get you in trouble. Um, and another way to say it is that it's barbaric. In a civilized society, we don't do that. Our system of justice is such that we punish the perpetrator, not the innocent person. Um, and you know, it's an inalienable right, right? The right to life that means that that's a right you cannot even give away. So you can't um, plead guilty to a crime without stating in your own words what you did to commit that crime because it's an inalienable right. That's how much we value not punishing innocent people. So that you can't plead guilty for something that, let's say your wife did because you want to try to protect her from going to jail. You have to state in your own words what you did to commit that crime. And so it entirely goes against our system of justice to punish, punish someone innocent. Uh, and that is barbaric. So they'll use words like barbaric, antiquated, you know, when you hear the word antiquated, you know, what I like to say is what's antiquated is child sacrifice. You know, because right away people hear child sacrifice and they think in terms of, um, you know, biblical examples of child sacrifice or, um, you know, Aztecs or, you know, examples from around the globe in times of antiquity when people engage in child sacrifice. Um, but that's what it is when you're willing to throw somebody a rape exception you're engaging in child sacrifice. And uh, that's barbaric. And so try to use their words when they try to say that, you know, um, you're barbaric or you're that's antiquated, you're going back in time. Remind them, you know, child sacrifice is antiquated. All right. Um, let me give you some examples where this has been very effective. Uh, I'm in the Gift of Life film with Governor Mike Huckabee, 
Mine is, it's a Citizens United film. Mine is one of several stories that's featured in that film. And so I had backstage passes to the premiere in Des Moines, Iowa. It was held in between two presidential debates. And so there were four presidential candidates who spoke at the premiere. Bachman, Santorum, Perry, and Gingrich. And I introduced myself. I told them that I'm the national spokeswoman for personhood. And right, right away, Bachman and Santorum said, oh, I signed the personhood pledge. I said, yes, I know. Thank you so much. Came out two days before. It was a no exceptions, no compromise pledge. And Perry and Gingrich had not signed it because they were both, at the time, about to be rape exception candidates. I handed them each my DVDs, Conceived and Rape from Worthless to Priceless, and our group DVD, Accepting Cases of Rape, 12 Stories of Survival, and my business card, Conceived and Rape, Targeted for Abortion. You know, subtle. And right away, Governor Perry was stunned, and he, he said, this is your story? And I shared with him how I was conceived, and my birth mother had been abducted at night point by a serial rapist. She went to two illegal abortions and I was almost aborted. Um, the law protected me. She backed out because it was illegal and was pro-choice when we met. For the next six years, she maintained that it should have been her right. And Governor Perry asked me, can I have your autograph? And I said, he said, well, make it out to my daughter. So I wrote 100% pro-life, Rebecca Keith Money. And then he asked me more questions and I shared with him how as an attorney, I've litigated numerous high profile cases defending human life to involve rape and abortion, um, the frozen embryo case in Michigan, and how I do speaking globally. And I have this network of what's grown to be now over 800 of us conceived and rape, mothers who became pregnant by rape, or either raising their children, regret avoiding birth mothers, or miscarrying, um, or incest or sex trafficking. And he said to me, you know, you're my heroine. I said, wow, thank you so much. But it's funny you say that, because my question for you is, would you be my hero? And I reminded, I'm alive today because of legislators who are my heroes, who protected me, no exceptions, that Michigan's never had a rape exception in a single law. And we still have our abortion bans on the books. The 1846 abortion ban and the 1931 outright abortion ban. And those laws protected me. And these legislators who were 100% pro-life, no exceptions, no compromise, are my heroes. And I asked him, would you be my hero too? And he said, yes, yes, I, I would. I told him, but you make that rape exception. And he put his head down. He was shaking and saying, wow, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. And he was thinking about it. And I didn't know how much time I'd have with him. I told him that I wanted to get my photo taken with him, but my battery's dead. And he said, well, I've got my own personal photographer. Come with me. And we went in his green room with, where they took tons of photos, which he never sent me. Um, but he, he had some footage of me, him, and, and Puckabee in his ad campaign. But as he's looking in the camera, he kept saying, I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And I looked up at him and I explained that when you make that rape exception, that's like saying to me that I deserve the death penalty for the crimes of my biological father. The US Supreme Court said that he didn't deserve the death penalty. In Coker v. Georgia, the court said that rapists do not deserve the death penalty. And in the second case of Kennedy v. Louisiana, they said that even for child molesters, it's cruel and unusual punishment. He was nodding his head. And I asked him, do you believe that I, the innocent child, deserved the death penalty? And he said, no, no, I don't. And I'm like, well, 
And he stopped me and he said, you know, tonight's event and this film are supposed to be all about changing hearts and minds. And right now, you're changing my heart. And I thought, hmm, changing? And I challenged him. No more rape exceptions. And he looked me in the eyes and he promised no more rape exceptions. And he went on to say that he had just never put a face to the issue before, that he had never considered it from the perspective of someone like me. He was the governor of Texas running for president, and he's never heard the arguments. But again, it goes to show what stories can do to pierce the heart in ways in which arguments cannot. The next morning, he signed the personhood pledge, and so did Newt Gingrich. And then Governor Perry went on national news talking about our conversation, how my story pierced his heart, saying that he could not look me in the eyes and justify the rape exception any longer. Now, he did not get lambasted. This is only a year after a Aiken lost. He did not get lambasted, or was it two years? Anyhow, he didn't get attacked for what he said because there was a real person, a woman associated with this story. And so the news published the story, but you didn't see the attacks like you saw with others. Like, for example, Santorum, who's wonderful, he got attacked for saying that sort of like with Murdoch, you know, he said, well, I still think that's a gift from God. And then, of course, they try to warp it and say, oh, you know, being raped is your gift from God. Of course, that's not what he meant. But that is not the best messaging because it's too easy to distort that. It's too easy for them to um, to manipulate it. And for sound bites, you just don't have the chance to explain, you know, theological issues such as like that good can come out of evil and that God doesn't intend evil and da da da. That that's a lot. So you don't want to wrap this kind of story in there by, by talking about God, because they'll just say that, um, you know, they'll just try to suggest that you're warped for saying that God intended that, like they did with Aiken. So that's why the, the stories are the best messaging and this is the idea of justice. So you can like wrap it in one story together. Like, you know, my friend Rebecca was conceived and raped and she did not deserve the death penalty for the crime of her biological father. Like, that's all you have to say. Now, when it comes to the issue of punish rapists, not babies, you know what President Obama said, right? When he was running, he said that I wouldn't want my daughter to be punished as a child, right? And so if you ever hear them try to say that, well, you're punishing the rape victim, aren't you? Easy reply. And you just say, well, where I come from, you know, a baby is not a punishment. And leave it at that. Just a simple res response of just saying that, you know, my opponent may believe that children are a punishment, but that's contrary to my beliefs and, and the beliefs of my constituent children are not a punishment. And I think that's sufficient to address that issue. Now, I did a recent video on YouTube I'm sorry, not on YouTube, on Facebook, um, about this issue of what about the pregnant 11 year old? Because there was a case in Ohio and I was getting a flurry of Google alerts and it's like people don't know how to answer that question. And so I took it head on. And um, I'll address that here now. So first of all, it's important to know that the younger a girl is, the more likely that it is that it's someone in the household who's been raping her or a family member, and then it's been going on for years. So it's important to know that it is the baby who finally reveals the rape, and in essence, ends up protecting her. It's the baby who is her hero by divulging what's been happening for years. And the younger she is, also the more likely it is that she's very far along in her pregnancy. In most of these cases involving a young girl, no one even knew that she was ovulating yet. 
part of hormone menstruating. So they're very often halfway through their pregnancy. And at that point, she's going to have to go through labor and delivery no matter what. So people think somehow that you're going to spare her having to go through labor. You're not. If you're doing a late-term abortion, um, second trimester, third trimester abortion, a lot of you know, you're going to have to insert laminaries. It's a three-day procedure. And very traumatic to have to go through all of that. Uh, I had a case in Michigan years ago involving a 12-year-old who was raped by her 14-year-old brother. And the judge ended up allowing her to go to Wichita, Kansas, like violating Michigan's law, go out of state to have this late-term abortion that the Kansas Attorney General said, this is not a case where this is legal in our state. Um, but they took her there and she went through the three-day procedure, but they stopped the baby's heart first. So she had to deliver a dead baby, which is far more difficult because you don't have the hormones communicating you know, with her body to be able to help that process along. And so it's a much more tra traumatic situation where she has to give birth to a dead baby. So the question is whether she's gonna give birth to a live baby or a dead baby. And what happened in that case is you had abortion doctors testifying, they did an affidavit to the court in Michigan correctly stating that if the girl was forced to carry the baby full term, that that could be dangerous to her life or health. But what he failed to disclose is that that's never the standard of care. You always deliver early when you can save both the baby and the mother without an issue. So when you have a petite mother, young mother, you deliver early. So they play on people's ignorance by throwing out statements like that. Uh, and so it's important to, to understand you know, the facts in that circumstance. The other thing is that oftentimes it's a girl's own mother who's either trafficking her or leaving her unprotected. So some of these high profile cases, like even in Latin America, where they want to take a, a girl for a late term abortion and they're saying that she wants the abortion, well, when they finally got her her from her mother, the girl didn't want this. Her mother was trying to protect like her boyfriend or husband or her brother or other family member. And she didn't want like a, a call to be made to Child Protective Services. And you have these women that will take their own daughters to the abortion clinic just so that they like don't get in trouble. And then the abortion clinic, as you may have seen with live action exposés, very often they do not report. And so they're protecting and enabling perpetrators. They protect and enable sex traffickers and child molesters. So we always use this hashtag, rapist love abortion. And that is a fact because it destroys the evidence and it protects them and enables them to continue perpetrating. If you do a search on Twitter or Facebook of hashtag rapist love abortion, you will see the plethora of court cases that have been reported in the news where there were repeated abortions or a prior abortion before the current pregnancy. And you find out that this child molester had taken her for abortions in the past. And so, if you want you know, proof, you can see all these documented cases um, you know, reported in secular news where you can see that clearly abortions, repeated abortions, were protecting and enabling the sex trafficker to continue to perpetrate for years. Studies also show that um, once a young girl gives birth, not only does the rape typically end for her, but also for all the other young girls in their households who are being raped. And so it's true that the baby <coughs> protects her. The baby's the one who delivers her out of that difficult situation. All right, um, general messaging on, well for, okay, a couple more things on the rape issue. Whenever you hear anybody say rapist child or rape baby, okay, or child of a rapist or monster's child, 
We get called all kinds of names, but that's probably the most common one. You guys have heard that, right? So the first response you want to have is correct them and say, you mean rape victim's child, okay? Tell them how insulting it is to the majority of rape victims who are raising their children to characterize their child as the rapist child after everything she's been through. You have the audacity to characterize her child as a rapist child. She should have no parental rights, no say, nothing, no connection to that child. And I've had some reporters like kind of be demeaning to me and say, well, isn't it a biological fact? There was actually a guy on Twitter yesterday that said something like that. Well, I'm just stating the science. <laughs> well, you know, the science of the biological fact is also that I'm a rape victim's child, but you chose not to say that. You chose to demonize an innocent child based upon someone else's wrongdoings. And my people group is the only people group left in society that's politically correct to demonize uh, and, and to completely bash, and it's dehumanizing, demoralizing. So please, whenever you hear rapist child, if you hear, if you're debating this issue on the floor and, or wherever, and you hear someone say rapist child, immediately correct them, rape victim's child. And if they try to challenge you, say, well, it's equally true that the child then is you know, genetically from both, but you're trying to dehumanize that child by solely associating them with that rapist. Um, the example I like to do, use is with President Obama. He's the polygamous child. You don't hear anybody say that. You would never get away with that. If you tried to call him the polygamous child, you would be immediately chastised. And so that's a good example. When I bring that up, people are like, yeah, that wouldn't be cool. <laughs> and then they get it. And they understand, and they start to apologize. And they realize when they see how insulting it is to these mothers that their child is called those names. Uh, we also get called demon seed, evil seed, Satan spawn, devil's child. And I'll just show you, look, look there's the, <laughs> no horns, <laughs> no horns. Um, but you don't call them out when they do that sort of thing, because sometimes you hear politicians use that language. Call them out that, you know, why would you discriminate like that? Why would you put that kind of a stigma on a child? They're going to have to live with that for the rest of their life. You know, and you can remind people there's a lot of famous people who are conceived in rape. Frederick Douglass was conceived in rape. Jesse Jackson was conceived in rape. Eartha Kitt. Um, I have a whole list of famous people conceived in rape on our website, but. These are great people, a lot of them great humanitarians who are conceived in rape. Uh, so it's important to remind them of that. Uh, all right. Then just generally on messaging, and then I'll open it up for questions. It's very important when it comes to the word termination, not to let them just get away with using this verbiage. Because, I mean, this, some of you may be surprised, but, you know, I terminated three of my pregnancies. You know, I prematurely terminated three of my pregnancies. We induced labor, my daughters are all doing quite well, but, you know, I terminated three of my pregnancies. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll say to them, but, so I, I, but you're not talking about that, right? You're not talking about the ones with the live babies? We talk about terminations of the live babies or the dead babies. Because the live babies, like, I have no problem with terminating pregnancies, but you mean dead babies, right? And then they're like, what? What are you talking about? Like, normal delivery to healthy babies or termination of a pregnancy. Call them out. You hear the word termination, think of that right away. Okay? And then explain to them this, this point, because that really gets people thinking. Um, Make them state what it is. Lila Rose talked about that. Like, make them finish the sentence when they say the right to choose. Choose what? You know, or when they say that they're for an abortion, she asks them, well, what is an abortion? 
And what is an abortion? What does an abortion do? Get them to state that. And then um, when uh, whenever you hear somebody say, well, personally, I'm pro-life. I find they usually don't want to say, and they'll just keep saying, well, well, it's just that I personally couldn't have one. Okay, why not? Like, wh why wouldn't you have one? Like, what do you mean? Well, well, what's wrong with it that you wouldn't have one? Like, and again, that's what you can ask, well, what is an abortion? Why don't you like it? And if they're honest, they'll, they will finally answer and tell you, well, it's just that I personally think that that's killing a human being. Okay, well, let's talk about that now. So that's an important way to have these discussions with people and get them to state what we're really talking about. Again, we're talking about dead babies. We're talking about the right to kill, the right to stop the beating heart, not just the right to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and then please, please, please don't ever use the word it when referring to an unborn child from conception. As I said, I represented the mother of Michigan's frozen embryo case. I co-founded Embryo Defense. From conception, the science is that they are living human beings. So to be, to be clear, frozen embryos are alive. I find that there's pro-life people who don't understand that concept that frozen embryos are alive. Okay, of course they're alive because they won't make any money in IVF clinics that they're freezing embryos and they're freezing dead embryos, right? You know, the whole practice is based upon the fact that these are living human beings. And this is why I tell people that, you know, if they're not transferring, if they're not, you know, freezing, thawing, transferring living human beings to a woman's uterus, they're not gonna make any money and they're gonna be in big trouble if, it, if that's anything but a living human. And so show people the absurdity of what they're suggesting when they say that's not a living human being. I mean, of course it's science, but tell a story, create a word picture. And that's how I do it to, sh to demonstrate the absurdity. I do it through the story of describing the absurdity of not having living human beings transferred transfer to a woman's uterus in an IVF clinic, right? They're gonna remember that connection. You're not just throwing science at them. Um, and they have a gender from conception. And the way I, I ask Christians to help remember for this is that it's kind of like in Genesis, you know, male and female, he cre from in the beginning he created them, male and female he created them. And right from our beginnings, God creates us male and female. And Nick Loeb, you may remember, he's, he's, by the way, the producer of Roe v. Wade film that will be coming out hopefully in the fall. Um, he has an embryo lawsuit with Sofia Vergara, and he has two daughters. He knows the gender of his children, their daughters. So anytime that you can use terms of gender, that serves to further humanize these children. Um, one of my pet peeves is the, the slogan in the pro-life movement, it's a child, not a choice. No, he or she is a child, not a choice, right? It is a dehumanizing term. How insulted would you be if you're holding your baby and somebody starts referring your baby as an it, right? And you quickly correct them, she. Uh, so please, please, please catch yourself because I find really that most polite people are in the habit of doing that. So please try to catch yourself and <coughs> humanize that child through terms of gender, but even better through terms of relationship. Speak in terms of sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, the sons and daughters of Missouri. You know, the unborn sons and daughters of Missouri. Well, that's going to touch the heart a little bit differently than, you know, just saying unborn children, right? Um, a lot of people can't relate to the concept of an embryo, but they can relate to the concept of heart, to the heart of a mother for her children. All right. Um, when it comes to, one more thing is the, heart, the other difficult cases, and by the way, when you hear them say, 
you might have noticed I keep saying the so-called hard cases because I hate that terminology being called a hard case because it's again insulting it's demeaning if you knew us, you'd know that we're all easy to love. <laughs> you know, the hard cases are the people with the hardened hearts. They're the tough nuts to crack. And the, the ones with the fatal heart defects are the doctors who are recommending abortion. They have a heart defect and it's lethal because people are dying over it. So whenever you hear that kind of language of, of hard cases, correct them. You know, no, the hard cases are the people with the hardened hearts, not these innocent children. So that's why I say so-called hard cases. And then um, when you hear the you know fatal heart defect, please use that kind of language that I use to point out that it's the doctors with the fatal heart, the lethal heart defect, and then you may have heard incompatible with life, which is terminology we'll often see in statutes all over the country. You know, incompatible with life, doctors will say that the child's incompatible with life. They'll testify, you have legislators who will say, what about a child who's incompatible with life? And it's, um, how can you be, number one, how can you be incompatible with life when you're living, when you're alive? As long as you have a heartbeat, you are alive and you're compatible with life. Um, every single one of us is fatal, right? None of us is um, gonna live forever. You know, we're all mere mortals. So uh, in that sense, you can say that we're, I guess we're all incompatible with life. But again, the ones that are incompatible with life are the, the doctor's philosophies. The, the doctor's values, their eugenics, the eugenics of the legislators, the that legislation that has those, those exceptions, that legislation is incompatible with life. But my, my friends um, from my organization, Save the One Again, Brad and Jesse Smith, they have a daughter with trisomy 18, a fatal fetal abnormality, the daughter's like 10 years old now, but apparently she still has a fatal fetal abnormality. They say she's compatible with love. So I really like that terminology. You know, you say incompatible with life, we say compatible with love and life. Um, we know that when you give these children a chance to live, so many of them um, can live if they're treated. And you gotta watch out for hospice care, perinatal hospice care, because Sometimes the perinatal hospice care is like hospice that we see where you have people who are engaged in eugenics and assisted suicide, where it's not really hospice care. What they do is they send these children home to die. I saw a story in Texas of perinatal hospice care, and they had a diagnosis of trisomy 18, and they had the parents picking out coffins when their baby wasn't even born. But these children can be treated. We have like essentially the first trisomy clinic in the United States at Mott Children's Hospital in Michigan and, and you know they're not formally calling it a trisomy clinic yet but they're they plan to establish one hopefully soon but they've treated I think 40 or more and very few of them have passed away when they have 90 percent over 90 percent die within their first year of life yet all these children aren't dying because you find that when they actually get treated they live and um, of course, Rick Santorum's daughter Bella is growing up. <sighs> All right, I think that's it for the messaging that I have for you. Um, oh, one more thing on the on the so on the fatal abnormality. When we sued the state of Iowa for the exceptions, the rape exception and the fetal abnormality exception. Uh, we argue that the Americans with Disabilities Act applied, that they're a suspect class and they're entitled to heightened protection, heightened scrutiny under that circumstance. And so whenever you hear them talk about lethal abnormalities, please point out, like, excuse me, you're talking about disabled children. 
It's very important to point that out, disabled children. When you change that language, people realize, oh, disabled children are protected. Yeah, we're not supposed to go after disabled children. It kind of, it really changes the conversation. And again, I got that from Fred and Jesse Smith from Save the One. Um, so please use that terminology when they try to talk about children with fetal abnormalities, talk about, oh, we're talking about disabled children. All right, I'll open up for questions now. Thank you so much. Um, can you give me your website? Our website is savethe1.com, and that's the number one, not the word. And mine is rebeccakeesling.com. I have business cards here. I brought, I, I gave one to the governor's office to steal shipping today, and then I have one of each here, too. Um, I didn't, I have more in my car, but there's, there's videos, a plethora of videos on YouTube and on our, on our website. We have group video. We have a lot of short videos on our Facebook page. Um, one of them, maybe, I'm told that there's a, a donor who may be interested in airing a commercial that we put together. Okay, and the other question I have is you said, I have a Twitter handle, I've never used it because it kind of scares me. Are you on Facebook? <laughs> Pardon me? Are you on Facebook? Yeah, I have Facebook. So, but my question you, you can link your Facebook to Twitter so that all of your Facebook posts go straight to Twitter. So you don't have to maintain Twitter separately unless you want to engage but in conversation. But Twitter has 140 character limit, right? Yeah, but the first 140 characters from your Facebook post show up on Twitter. Oh, okay. Okay, so you said do a search on Twitter. Or Facebook. Facebook or does hashtags now. You said, I forgot I wrote it, what you said. Look and Instagram it. does hashtags as well. Anyway, you said there would be a couple of hours. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you can do it on Facebook. Hashtag rapists love abortion. Put it in the search box? With the hashtag? We also do the punish rapists, not babies. So, hashtag rapists love abortion in the search box. Yep. In the Facebook search box. Okay. okay. Ready? Uh, so, as far as resources, Yeah, the rape, rape victim advocacy groups overwhelmingly are pro abortion only. And oftentimes, you may have seen this here in Missouri, they testify against pro life legislation. And so it's hard to find a good place to be able to send them. There are some churches, and there have been even pregnancy resource centers that have um, support groups for victims of violence for female victims of whether domestic violence or, or rape. Um, there definitely needs to be a lot more of that. In my organization, we, we help them. We have a huge support network. We have over 200 blogs posted to our blog of stories. And then uh, we have a private Facebook group for moms who all became pregnant by rape and are raising their children. We have a private group of moms who are post aborted from rape and regret aborting. We have a separate group for the birth mothers from, from rape. And we have uh, also a group for the men who are conceiving rape and a separate, separate group for the women who are conceiving rape. And these, these are really big groups. The, the moms group who are raising their children is extremely active, like more than daily. Like there's people posting stuff and it's such a wonderful support network. This is nationwide group. It's global, yeah. 
And then we also have regional groups besides like our mom's group for the mothers raising their children. We have Save the One Africa for everybody from Africa who was conceived in rape, became pregnant by rape, or uh, were told by doctors to abort, or their parents were told to abort them. We have Save the One Europe, Save the One Australia, we have Save the One Canada, and then we have like Save the One Michigan, Save, like we have it, we, we have Save the One Pacific Northwest, like depending on where we have big groups of people all set up a Facebook group so that they can all coalesce and be available to testify, to be able to do um, a rally together, to be able to speak on a campus, do a panel together. We've done a lot of that. Um, and to be able to show up at 40 Days for Life together, I mean, whatever it is, but that you, know, you have your group and you can meet in person and not be alone. Like I was alone for 10 years before I met someone else. And it's like our tribe. I mean, it feels like a family. It's, it's, so it's, it's important for people to be connected. I, I want people to feel connected. I can't have a personal relationship with over 800 people. You know, there's those that I talk to on the phone regularly, and I talk on the phone when I help them get their story out. But now they're connecting with each other, like through the state groups and and um, sending each other friend requests and posting words of support when something comes up, and then they become Facebook friends. And so we want them to be in relationship with one another. And have, you know, because it helps when you're Facebook friends with each other, and they say that, like, you know, everybody else is normal. You know, they're all living normal lives when the world makes you feel like ostracized, like there's something wrong with you. I tell you, the past month has been really hard on the people in our organization. They've been expressing it a lot. And some of them said they just had to get off social, social media because they can't take the way people are talking about their children or the way they're talking about them. And some of them are really fighting back, and I'm super proud of them. Some of them who never wanted to talk publicly are coming out and just enough's enough's enough, you know. Here's my story. But it's hard. But having each other like helps give you courage. Assess, but uh, with laws outlawing abortion but making the exceptions of rape and incest, uh, do you think that that exception would actually encourage a rapist uh, that the rapist might consider that if a pregnancy did result from his action that the woman would surely uh, get an abortion or if she did get an abortion she wouldn't you know be uh, have any problem doing it do you think that could actually encourage rapists well a lot of rapists they don't don't force them. That. <laughs> they'll force them into aborting um, we know the number one victim of domestic violence is pregnant women and it's not because they want an abortion it's because they want to have the baby and so, you know, this abusers, you know, if they can't get them to go to an abortion clinic, then they try to kill the baby themselves. Um, she deserves like real protection. They need to be protected. Uh, but, you know, what you have legal says a lot to people about morality, you know, right and wrong. Um, and you know, we gotta start with the legal protection for these girls. You know, I don't know that, um, well, here's something that we posted this past week. The man who's like the CEO of the number one, I guess they call it a sugar daddy website. It's something, it's not connections, it's, I forget the name of it, but we posted it on our page this week. Um, it's some website where he connects like wealthy older men to younger what they call sugar babies i've never even heard that phrase before but on their website they talk about the sugar babies um you know can be like taken care of you know by these men which the ceo came out and said that he will pay for abortions for 
any of these women um, who are like connected, who are sugar babies, and they're, and they're in states where abortion's illegal, he will pay for them for their abortions. Like, well, what does that say? I mean, how creepy is that? You know, because some of these relationships are kind of suspect, like how many of these girls are being trafficked, you know, through this website. And so the fact that he's like offering to pay for these abortions, almost like it's necessary for his business to continue. So he said that he'll pay for them to, you know, go somewhere else to go get an abortion. I, I think that says a lot about, you know, you asked what do rapists think about legislation? Well, the fact that he said that, I think, says a lot. I think this kind of, to me, what's a, a suspect. Um, organization, you know, dating site. It's supposed to be like no strings attached with sugar daddies and sugar babies. I mean, just the name of sugar baby is like cringeworthy, right? I had, I had an exchange, well, no, I didn't really exchange with them. I posted about the St. Louis abortion clinic on Facebook just it was a news blurb from life news and i was instantly attacked by three people who said your source is not um credible it's not credible what my question is about this research that was done by michigan right to life georgia right to life and the third one um do you think that it, that research will also be attacked as not credible because it comes from a biased source? Well, this is just messaging, like in the house messages. Um, and you know, they gave me a copy of it, and I do the training based upon this messaging. But you know, this is not something that you know they're sharing with the world with you know pro-choice activists who have to see what our messaging says about people's views on abortion you know this is done for our benefit and um white's life of michigan decided that they would use this and really go after this issue so they ended up doing running five ads statewide using people from st Louis uh to be able to change hearts and minds in the state of michigan and they ran um, on television and they did fundraising to run these ads on television and on radio to be able to sway people over on, on this issue. So they didn't just, you know, commission this study, you know, just for the sake of it, just to have it, but so that they could learn what do we need to do to change hearts and minds. So that was for the pro-life movement's benefit, not for anybody else. You know, why, why do we want to tell them what our study show. That's why like I'm doing Facebook Live, but it's for I have a group of about fifty save the one speakers globally and several of them are watching it right now. Um, but that's like in house information, right? Yeah. I had a friend on Facebook who reposted um, a post from the Kentucky National Organization for Women. And it says the most revealing part of the Alabama abortion law is that the personhood of the holy embryo doesn't apply to those in fertility clinics. And uh, then it goes through and says that, well, there it is. It's not really about the embryo, it's about the woman's body. How do you respond to something like that? For embryos? Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the case of Sophia Madara and Nick Lowe. Their agreement was that they would use a surrogate. What does that even have to do with her body at that point? You know, we're not even talking about her body. We're talking about children who are ex utero. But they're not supporting. This isn't about a woman's body when you're talking about frozen embryos. You know? Um, and they're, they're supporting destroying embryos or not giving them the opportunity to be born or using them for research purposes. And, and you know, this doesn't even involve a woman's body. If the left sees it, or I should say the, the abortionist sees it, you can 
people say the sky is blue and they're going to come and attack you. <laughs> so it doesn't, to them, facts do not matter to them. So, you know, remember, we're in a war, so they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna throw out lies anyway. So yeah. just, just expect that. Because they're going to, and their talking points, they have these talking points that they will continue using all the time and no one ever challenges. Yeah, but those are the radical you know, abortion activists. But there, there are a lot of people in the middle, though, who are just observing. You know, and just, just remember that. There, there are silent people who are watching on Facebook, and they're not commenting. They don't quite have the courage to do so, but they're taking it in. And so obviously it's important how you conduct yourself versus how they conduct themselves. And if they do tell lies like that, then you know you can easily find a source and, and post it. Um, my philosophy on Facebook is that my Facebook timeline and my pages are like my front lawn. And that's my property and I use my front lawn to put up the signs which represent the candidates and causes I believe in. And I welcome you to my front door to have conversations. Uh, and we, we can have conversations on these issues. But when you start desecrating my sign, when you start putting up your yard signs in my yard, you have violated the boundaries of my yard. And I'm gonna take those down and if I have, if you keep doing it, then I'll block you, right? I'm not creating a platform for your views. We can exchange can ideas, but post? huh? No, I can take down somebody's yeah, take down post, post. Yeah. Oh, yeah. on your yes. on your timeline, or their comment on your timeline. And on my pages, I mean, I'll delete and ban if they're being cruel. If they want to have a conversation, I'm all for it because that's how we win hearts and minds. I want to have those conversations. I, I, my goal is to win them over. Um, you know, I, I don't want to just win arguments. I want to win hearts, right? But if they're cruel and they're being disrespectful or if they're like really just putting up their own yard signs and they're not interested in having a true dialogue, then I'll delete and I'll ban them. Because this is my platform. People respect me. I've developed my own pro I'm not here to provide you a platform. Yeah. You know? just, just real quick, on my page, I have, I post rules periodically for people. If you're going to be on my on my timeline, I'll make posts. There are certain things you're allowed to do. You can't use profanity, certain things like that. Um, and I let them know that either I'll delete them or delete, or they can delete me. So. Um, Set up rules and set up boundaries for your own page because you're allowed to do that. Now, I, I tend to comment more and engage with people more on Twitter. Um, even sometimes when, when they're cool, because then people can see the dialogue and a lot of people will retweet my re replies. Like, it, it's interesting because I find a lot more people are following those conversations and retweeting the aspects of those conversations than they are like the original post that I make. You know, it's amazing how many people are watching those dialogues. Like again, they're silent people. You don't realize they're watching, but they are. And then they see one reply that I suddenly make in a whole thread and they're like, oh, that one's really good. I'm gonna retweet <laughs> that one. You know, so they've been watching for a long time, not retweeting and all of a sudden they see something like, I'm retweeting that. So I find that having those kinds of dialogues are, are effective. A lot of good stuff can come out of it. What's but your Twitter? It's not on here. It's at Rebecca Kiesling without the G on the end because Twitter wouldn't allow my full name. <laughs> and our our Save the One is Save the One Child at Save the One Child on Twitter because someone took Save the One and they never used it. But they won't hand, they wouldn't give it to us. They were like created in Germany and they never use it. Like, <laughs> like they saw our organization and went to Twitter to set it up before we had a chance. <laughs> so we're saved the one child on Twitter and um, but we don't we don't interact so much on Twitter. All of our posts go straight to Twitter, but I interact under Rebecca Keesling. Like I've been doing a lot more of that lately and on Instagram.
Kids. I actually have like a lot of transgender people who follow me on or, or the LGBTQ community like follow me and support me on Twitter, you know, which is really, you know, interesting. Um, it's, it's like the younger people in the pro-life movement have, have really changed a lot. Um, but I, I try not to post stuff on, on anything now that's really collateral. Um, I try to focus on my issue of expertise, um, and I tend not to focus on on other issues. Like I try to stay away from like, you know, gun rights or the war on poverty or like, you know, just focus on my one issue because I have expertise on that, and I don't want to get sidetracked. Um, Um, a couple of things. Um, if you're an elected official in the country now, you almost to the point with politigation, the left keeps suing the right. If we block you on Facebook or Twitter, I'm in a federal lawsuit now as a state representative. Started with Trump and it's worked its way down. Governor of Kentucky, Ohio Senator, myself of Missouri, etc. So if you're an elected official, you do have to be yeah. careful if it's your personal or if it's an official. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted a quick take, and I know I think we're supposed to be upstairs here pretty quick, um, that uh, the movies Gosnell and Unplanned are maybe winning some hearts of those that are on the fence, and I just wanted to see if you had a comment on that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard people say that they're watching the movie. One woman said she saw the movie hours away and got it to her hometown she'd never been involved at all and she was so inspired that she bought up a whole theater like never having done any pro-life activism ever she bought the whole theater and got it sold out like she bought it and then just counting on that people are going to want to see this and it was sold out so it's like wow you know hearing stories like that is so encouraging that people who are never active are all of a sudden really active and invested I'm sad a lot of people still haven't heard of Gosnell yet, though. Um, I'd say that uh, Unplanned got a lot more um, publicity and you know, more people saw it. All right, thank you so much.